Welcome to part three of today's lecture. In the first part of today's lecture, we looked at nonviolence in general and focused on civilian defense as it was a potential measure. In part two, we examined the case for and against civilian peacekeeping, unarmed civilian peacekeeping, as another measure of nonviolence. In part three of today's lecture, we're going to explore the relationship between nonviolence and pacifism more generally. As I said at the start of today's lecture, pacifism often, pacifists often defend nonviolent options as the plausible alternative to going to war. And if one thinks that there are, is quite a lot going for the alternatives that we looked at today for civilian defence or for and or for unarmed civilian peacekeeping, this might provide some support for pacifism. In other words, pacifism might appear to be more attractive since there is more going for the alternatives than one might think for, at first. So this might seem to support pacifists' political project of seeking to resolve conflicts without looking to military solutions. But what about pacifism as a theory? There are several varieties of pacifism and much contestation about the exact meaning of pacifism. All pacifists agree in their general opposition to war and the need to seek nonviolent alternatives, but they differ in exactly how they understand this. On some pacifists' account, their rejection of war is soft. Let's call this the soft rejection of war. Pacifism is just general opposition to war. These pacifists accept that occasional wars can still be permissible. Such pacifists claim, for instance, that we should try to avoid war, that wars are only very occasionally permissible, and that militarism, i.e. promoting the military, supporting the military and society, is problematic. Albert Einstein, Bertrand Russell, famous philosopher, both claimed to be pacifists, but supported the war against Nazi Germany, with the latter Bertrand Russell admitting that very few wars are worth fighting. Another example is Andrew Fiola, in his account of practical pacifism. This holds that war might be permissible according to the principles of just war, but just wars are rare, and the burden of proof lies with those wanting to advocate war. Now there's an obvious worry here, and this is that these accounts of pacifism, this soft rejection of war, is not clearly distinct from the dovish accounts of just war theory which holds that few wars will meet the requirements of just war. If you remember call in lecture two, I put on screen the graph of the different views in just war theory with some more hawkish and some more dovish. It's not clear that on this understanding of pacifism, those at the more dovish end of just war theory would disagree from the soft rejection of war. So is the soft pacifism is this just another form of just war theory? Dwayne Cady, who I mentioned earlier in today's lecture, tries to avoid this worry. He suggests that just war and pacifism can be viewed on a continuum of opposition to war. In Cady's view, pacifism opposes war more than just war theory. But this still doesn't seem to be particularly helpful. It's not a conceptually clear difference. To separate the views, there would need to be a threshold of opposition to war on the continuum to make it clear where pacifism starts and just war begins. More commonly, pacifism is understood not as in the soft rejection of war as a general opposition to war, but more strongly, forthrightly, that war is impermissible. 
This is the harder rejection of war. It provides a much cleaner, conceptually, understanding of what war is that clearly demarcates it from just war theory. Now, there are two different versions of the harder rejection of war, the hard rejection of war for pacifism, on this version of pacifism. Important distinction here. The absolutist pacifist, the absolutist pacifist holds that war is always impermissible. This means that for now and forevermore, and previously, war has always been wrong and it's never been justifiable to go to war. Absolutely wrong. There can never be occasions when it's right. Contingent pacifist approach, on the other hand, holds that war is currently impermissible and will be for the foreseeable future. But they don't rule out the potential that war in the past might have been justifiable or in the future could potentially be justifiable in the longer term future, that is. The absolute pacifists never, ever Contingent pacifists currently contingent on the imperial current circumstances, contingent on the current circumstances, war is wrong, war is impermissible. So why do pacifists endorse these claims? There are two central objections to war made by absolutist and pac contingent pacifists, and these are consequentialist and deontological. In other words, they concern the consequences of war and then concern the intrinsic or non-instrumental reasons in favour of not going to war. So let's take the consequentialist argument. I should say these terms should become clearer as we go on. The consequentialist or instrumental objection concerns the propensity for war to cause significant harm. The suggestion is in short that war either contingently, if you're contingent pacifist, or always if you're an absolutist pacifist, does more harm than good. It does this by harming innocents and innocent non-combatants. It destroys infrastructure, divides communities, undermines international order, increases the power of the military and society, spends vast resources on military infrastructure that could be spent on other public services, and more generally promotes violence as a solution to domestic and international issues when there are plausible non-violent options. All the potential benefits of wars, any potential benefits of wars, will not outweigh these various harms. So even if war might occasionally do some harm, there are huge non-instrumental -inst problems with going to war. Consequences of war outweigh any potential benefits. The second central objection is deontological. This might be viewed as an intrinsic objection or non-instrumental or an inherent objection. It's saying that war is wrong, regardless of its consequences, all these, regardless of the first sorts of reasons, even if we put that aside, the point here is war is wrong inherently. And this is because, pacifists argue, wars tend to do harm. What this means is that when you go to war, it's your state that is doing the killing. And it's often thought to be particularly wrong to do harm yourself. Now, to illustrate this, I want to introduce some moral philosophy. Some of you might have come across this already, but so others of you might not. A central principle of deontological moral thinking, or the deontology, is called the doctrine of doing and allowing. This says that other things being equal, doing harm is worse than allowing harm. To understand what this means, Consider 
the following scenario by Philip of Foot, which has been adapted by Warren Quinn. This is a very, fa very famous scenario that you'll come across in various textbooks in political and moral philosophy and in ethics more generally. In Rescue One, we can say by the five people in danger of drowning in one place or a single person of drowning somewhere else. We can't save all six, we've got to choose. In Rescue Two, we can save the five only by driving over and thereby killing someone who for an unspecified reason is trapped on the road. If we do not undertake the rescue, the trapped person can be later freed. Now in Rescue One, it seems quite straightforward. You can either save five people or you can save one person. You should say the five people, but rescue two is trickier. You can save five people only by harming one other person. It seems that we should not run over the trapped person because we should not do harm ourselves. It seems morally better, unfortunately, if we were to allow the other five to die. Now, some pacifists say something similar. They argue it is morally better not to do harm by not going to war, to not do harm by not going to war, to keep your hands clean, even if this will allow more harm overall. It's morally preferable not to engage in harm yourself, not to do harm, even if this will allow harm. Suppose, for instance, that there's a bombing campaign, humanitarian intervention, you could launch it, but it would kill 1,000 civilians unintentionally as a side effect. Not, you're not intending, but you can foresee that you would kill 1,000 innocent civilians. Ultimately, it would save 10,000 lives, say by defeating a rebel group that is hell-bent on killing an ethnic group. If you don't intervene, you're going to allow these 10,000 civilians to die. So the choice would be killing 1,000 civilians yourself and saving 10,000, so saving 9,000 overall, or not intervening and not doing harm yourself. According to pacifists, many would oppose the intervention because by engaging in the bombing campaign, you would be doing harm yourself. And this is deeply morally problematic, inherently morally problematic, intrinsically, deontologically, to use the synonyms. Okay, let's look at some of the responses to this, to pacifism. One of the main responses is that it seems that in certain cases, all things considered, wars might be justifiable. So in second seminars, we ran around the room, many of you came up with cases where you thought that war was justifiable. Not many, but some cases where war is justifiable. One might include cases such as intervention in Kosovo in 1999, certain wars of self-defense, and the most obvious, of course, is World War II. So if wars can be justified, something seems to be amiss then with pacifism. And this appears to be particularly challenging to the absolute weight given by some pacifists to the difference between doing and allowing harm. Pacifists appear to hold that it's never permissible to do harm, but it might be intuitively plausible to do harm to one person in order to save thousands. So suppose the rescue two were a bit different, you would have to harm one person, but you could save a million. Then you might think it's plausible to still do harm. Now pacifists can reply to this argument and say that although it might seem that some wards in the past have been justified, the standard predominant case used World War II, Allies' war in World War II, 
was now over 70 years ago. Another similar war where there is so clearly an evil that must be defeated and the proportionality costs very clearly favour going to war is not currently feasible. All currently feasible wars, the reply runs, are unlikely to be justified, mostly because they will be disproportionate or there will be other options that could be undertaken instead. So, to deny contingent pacifism, it needs to be feasible that a war here and now or in the foreseeable future could be justified not a war that was over 70 years ago. Now, you might still not agree with contingent pacifism, since you think that some recent wars have been justified and similar wars in the future might well be justified, such as the 1999 intervention in Kosovo that I've already mentioned, potentially intervention in Libya in 2011, 2015 action to protect the Yazidis from the threat of genocide by ISIS, so on and so forth. But the, con the case for these wars is much more contested than it was for the Allies' war in World War II. Now, the second response is that pacifism appears to be radically amiss with our understanding of individual self-defense. Individual self-defense is a big doctrine of work that looks at the philosophy of when it's plausible for individuals to defend themselves. Draws on common sense morality, draws on various legal positions and states across the world. Now in this, it's widely held that individuals can defend themselves against unjust attacks on a one-to-one -one basis and use violence if necessary. To deny this would seem hugely counterintuitive and potentially problematic. It would appear to suggest that if you are being attacked by a violent aggressor, it is impermissible to defend yourself. But if violence and potentially violence, even the full force can be used at the, even full force can be used at the individual level, it's unclear then why it can't be used as well at the state level. So the argument here then is that pacifism is inconsistent. If self-defense at the individual level is acceptable, then why is it not acceptable for states to go to war for self-defense? And the individual level, if it's acceptable for one to use violence to come to the assistance of those being attacked, for instance, being mugged in the streets, if you can use violence to come in and help them, then why is it not permissible for states to wage wars of humanitarian intervention to use violence to assist those being subject to mass atrocities or other serious human rights abuses? Now, I should say that pacifists do respond to these claims. They argue that opposition to war at the state level does not mean opposition to defensive violence at the individual level. Perhaps the most plausible response that they can make is to highlight problems of militarism associated with war, using them to just justify their war rather than the prohibition on individual violence. Still, whether you think that this is an influential knockdown objection to pacifism is up to you. And there's big philosophical disagreements here between pacifists and those who reject pacifism. To finish today's lecture, I want to consider the relationship between pacifism and nonviolence. On the one hand, you might think that the option typically favoured by pacifists, nonviolence, is limited. This can admit that nonviolence might be successful in response to internal repression of the sorts of cases that Chenoweth and Stefan look at, but might seem less plausible in response to international responses. Civilian peacekeeping and civilian defence, you might think, are limited in the face of external aggression. On the other hand, you might think that there is more to nonviolence and pacifism than it first seems. 
these options you might think on the contrary can actually achieve quite a lot even in the face of serious aggression so pacifism might appear plausible whatever you think about this i want to make one final point and this brings back goes brings us back to gene sharp sharp is keen to emphasize that the case for nonviolence does not depend on the case for pacifism. And Sharp draws an important distinction here. Strategic nonviolence, he argues, what he calls strategic nonviolence, defends nonviolence because it is successful. It works. On this view, if it doesn't work, then coercive strategies, even violent strategies, might be adopted. By contrast, principal nonviolence insists on nonviolence. It might be because of, say, religious or personal conviction, or because of the difference between doing and allowing in moral philosophy, and the fact that violence does harm. Principal nonviolence is much more likely to require pacifism. What's important to highlight here, then, is that nonviolence can be defended by those who adopt the strategic view of nonviolence. And this doesn't mean that one is necessarily a pacifist. One might accept that war is sometimes necessary as a justified response to aggression. But one can still maintain that nonviolence is often a plausible and desirable option because it works, especially in response to internal aggression. For instance, those who reject pacifism can still defend civilian peacekeeping and civilian defense, although they might think it needs to be accompanied by military force occasionally. So the key point is this, whereas all pacifists pretty much endorse nonviolence, not all advocates of nonviolence are pacifists. This brings to an end today's lecture. We've explored the case for nonviolence in general, looking at the notion of political jujitsu. We looked at civilian defense, one major measure of nonviolence fo that focuses on resisting aggression. We looked at unarmed civilian peacekeeping that concerns using pe sending peacekeepers abroad that don't have arms to engage in unarmed civilian uh, international protective accompaniment, unarmed. Then we've looked at the relationship between nonviolence and pacifism, some of the arguments for and against pacifism. Next week, we turn to another potential measure to address mass atrocities and serious external aggression. And this is the use of positive incentives, positive inducements. These are potential rewards that are offered to belligerents or to other parties to stop engaging in mass atrocities or aggression. As we will see, these raise some very interesting and tricky ethical, political, international issues. Thank you.